The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to our webinar today. Thank you so much for joining us. Get started just a second here. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Assistant Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. We have a wonderful presentation today that will last just about an hour and we'll have plenty of time for your questions as we move through. Only the speakers have audio, so if you have any questions or comments or if you have resources to share, feel free to enter them into the question or the chat box. The session is being recorded and it'll be posted on our website soon after and you'll also receive a link to the recording. If you'd like to follow along on the handouts, you can download them in the handout pane. You'll see a, a PDF document there. And we usually have a pretty active Twitter discussion. I don't know about today. We have some smaller attendance, but if you'd like to follow along, the hashtag is WCET webcast. Today's webinar is Learn About Being Digitally Inclusive, a conversation with WCET's Digital Inclusion Award winner. We'll do some brief introductions, and then we'll have Dr. Vadi run us through the Southwestern Indian Polytechnic Institute Robotics Program. We'll talk a little bit about the award. We'll get into the question and answer period. Again, if you have any questions, just enter them into the chat box, and our moderator will be monitoring those questions as we go through and then save those toward the end of the presentation. We have a terrific moderator today, Andrea Dees. She's the Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Capella, and she'll be introducing our speaker, Nadir Vidi, who's the Faculty Coordinator for Engineering and Engineering Technology Programs at Southwestern Indian Polytechnic Institute. So I will go ahead and pass it off to you, Andriel. Thank you, Megan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Megan mentioned, my name is Andre Aldiz, and I serve as the Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Capella University, which is located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We are a university of about 38,000 students, completely online, uh, mostly uh, serving all, all adult learners in mainly capacities of master's and doctoral programs, but we also have a bachelor's program as well. Um, I had the pleasure of um, meeting Dr. Vidi uh, at the Digital Inclusion Award earlier this summer, um, and I also was excited to uh, see about all of the work that has been done at uh, the Polytechnic Institute that he works at. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over the uh, uh, um, the audio to Dr. Vidi and allow him to introduce himself and to get started with um, his presentation. So thank you, Dr. Vidi, for coming. Thank you, Angel. Thank you, Megan. And I'd like to thank uh, WCT for this opportunity for me to share my work and my story with the audience. And I'd like to greet my audience. My name is Nader Vadi. I'm currently a faculty and coordinator for engineering and engineering technology programs at the Southwestern Indian Polytechnic Institute, CIPI. CIPI is a national Indian community college and uh, it's federally funded. I am a, I'm an engineer by training. I have a PhD degree in electrical engineering from the University of New Mexico. But I consider myself a STEM educator. And that's what I have been done past 40 years in different capacities. Yeah, what uh, I like to share with my audience is the innovative STEM programs that we have designed and implemented that have empowered our Native American students' audience. So I'd like to share some of the insights, some of the visions that we shared that runs 
through uh, the threat of all these innovations. Before, before I start, I'd like to give you a background information about the population that I serve. Uh, past 40 years, most of my professional life has been focused on working with the uh, uh, underrepresented, underserved pop population in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The past 30 years, I have been involved with uh, several programs that are focused on um, Native Americans, uh, Hispanics, and African Americans uh, from middle school, high school level, all the way to uh, college and graduate level. And past 20 years have been my focus have been working with, uh, has been working with the Native American communities, Native Americans serving or predominantly serving uh, uh, schools, high schools, uh, and tribal colleges. And so there is some statistics that I found uh, on, in a publication from Sandia National Laboratory by a friend of mine and a colleague, uh, Sandra Begay, who she's a Native American engineer. Uh, and uh, a principal member of the technical staff at Sandia National Lab. In the report, it says uh, American Indians and Alaskan natives are not prevalent in engineering. Although they make up 1.2% of the total population, they represent only 0.4% of all engineering bachelor's degrees recipients, 0.3% of the engineering workforce, and 0.1% of all engineering faculty. This is based on a, a statistical a statistic uh, reported by NACME in 2015. American Indian and Alaskan Native students have the lowest graduation rate among any minority group. Only 47% of the American Indian, American, and Alaskan Native students attended public high schools where the full range of mathematics and science courses were offered. This is from 2011 and 2012. Only seven of 100 American Indian and Alaskan Native kindergarten students will earn a bachelor's degree. American Indian and Alaskan Native students have less access to rigorous mathematics and science coursework in high school compared to other race and ethnicity groups. So this is the statistic that has been uh, the case uh, for the past 20 years that I have been involved with the, this uh, population of our students. The, a school that I am a faculty, uh, I joined them as a full-time faculty in 2004. It's a national community college. There are 36 tribal colleges across the United States, and the, most of them are affiliated with one tribe. Our school is a federally funded and a national community college and serves in Native Americans from Alaska all the way to New Mexico and Four Corner area. The, it's one of the two schools that is funded by uh, federal government. And uh, our population, our students represent more than 70 different tribes. Of course, because of the proximity in being in Southwest area, we do get a majority from 
Navajo tribe, Diné people, and uh, from the Southwest. It's an open enrollment school. So as long as there are uh, member, enrolled member of a tribe, a federally recognized tribe, Indian tribe, they are accepted. So there's no, no entrance selection based on the ACT or um, SAT. And the average age of the students, the population that I serve is about 24, 25. And uh, more, a lot of them with families, married. They have the, some of them single moms, single dads. And they have tried their luck in many different ways. So this is their last stop to make it and 70% of the students who enter as freshman students, they have a math and science or English level of proficiency of eighth or ninth grade level. So they need pre-college and remediation. The majority of them are first generation college students. And uh, one important aspect of the population, the Native American students, is their strong ties with their communities, with family, community, their tribe, a very place-based culture. And that makes it a big difference when you design or you work with a population of Native Americans. Next, please. So I have put together, I have had four um, parts vision that I have followed throughout my work with uh, my programs uh, for Native American schools and communities. The first one is a fair, equitable, and win-win partnerships with the mainstream colleges. Uh, so we do have a, a, a wide range of partners that I have established with local four-year schools and across the nation, agencies, federal agencies, philanthropic uh, organizations that, uh, that was one of the guiding principles. The second one is the capacity building on tribal colleges. So that was always my focus that we build capacity on the campus in order to train more and better students rather than sending them out uh, as soon as they finish the basics. So, and then the third one is the sharing resources among tribal colleges. Each one of these tribal colleges has its own strength, but the key and then the numbers and does not justify for every college, a travel college to have an engineering program. So the key success principle is to share resources among travel colleges. And I will mention, I will show you some of the successful uh, summer institutes or programs that we have had with our sister tribal colleges. And it's growing and then it has been very successful. And of course, the, of course, the fourth focus has been always to establish sustainable programs. 
planning educational program does not follow the four-year election cycle of the country or the budget cycle. It's, it, it's a long-term visionary 10 to 20 years planning. We need to make sure that we are not swayed, change directions and focus with the change in the um, federal government or non-federal funding available. We need to put focus to focus on our long-term goals. I have seen a lot of programs that um, the funding expires and the program dies. So that has been a suspect, that, that has been a focus of uh, sustainable programs. So this is the, the four part vision that I have been always uh, followed in my partnerships and grant writing. So I like to start with uh, some of the innovations in outreach and recruitment. Uh, you will see a lot of focus on robotics, but I want to emphasize that robotics is a tool that we use. But the, focus, but the goal is to show the students the relevance of math, science, computational tools, and communication. That the choice of robotics is more appealing to our population that are already digitally savvy or they're already computer savvy. These are the two of the platforms that we developed uh, at our institutions. And the, the, the one to the right is the IC Mars rover and that we built it to mimic the Mars rovers. And then uh, the other one is the Swarmy uh, rover built by University of New Mexico and we are part of the program that uh, mm, there's a group of rovers that they can communicate and they work together as a colony of ants or bees and to achieve a um, common goal. So they call it biologically inspired robotics. My team attended the national competition in 2016 and 17 uh, and uh, the first time they won the third place and uh, this year they won the grand prize, uh, gold prize, uh, competing with nationally. And that was a real boost uh, in the confidence and the morale of not only my school, but across the Indian country and other travel cultures. So, and also we have a homemade uh, mobile robot, educational mobile robot platform that is fully uh, designed, programmed by my student teams for outreach to high schools. Uh, starting ninth grade, eighth and ninth grade. Uh, and then we have high school partners that we provide these rowers uh, with, uh, with the manual, assembly manual, and the book of activities. And my senior students uh, actually participate. They join the teachers in high schools as teaching assistants, uh, as the co-teachers uh, to connect with the Native American students. So this year we are adding two more technologies to these rovers. Uh, one technology is a 3D printing or additive manufacturing. So rather than shipping the whole kit, we ship the electronics parts and then we provide them with a 3D printer and the training for use of the 
CAD softwares and 3D printers. And so they will print the parts on their side, on their own site schools, and they assemble it and they test it. So, so they are exposed to robotics principles, sensors, mm, actuators, microprocessors, and also to advanced manufacturing technology. And then one added feature this year, we are adding a module that uh, based on computational linguistics. So it, the module is capable of natural language understanding. And then uh, we can program it for native language words. We have started with the DNA language, up to 13 commands in voice, and a sequence of commands, but we like to expand it to other native languages. And it's uh, very interesting to bring some aspects of arts and language also into the robotics, and to get the kids interested to, in learning their own native languages. So there are three different technologies, mm, robotics, um, computational linguistics and uh, 3D printing. And we have also been able to integrate Alexa, Amazon Alexa, uh, uh, in, with the, and interface them with the robotic rower actions in order to, for the students can engage in conversations uh, with the rower uh, about outreach or questions in um, space technology, space sciences, or going to college, and different aspects of that. Next, please. Dr. Vidi. Hi, yeah. Dr. Vidi. This is Andrea. I just had a, Andrea Aldiz, um, just for, from a, a moderator's perspective. I, I'm very excited. Um, this is exciting work from the standpoint of um, one where it where it is situated in a community college, I think that kind of breaks the um, stereotype about what can be offered at that level. But one of the things I, I had a question about was related to how the preparedness of the students and bridging that gap. Because one of the things you mentioned at the very beginning was the fact that a lot of the students are coming in maybe not at a level of readiness from a, maybe a reading standpoint or um, in some cases, some science standpoints. What are some of those uh, ways that you, your institution are bridging the gaps so that they're ready to take on uh, these very uh, technical and uh, really high level, uh, this high level work um, and, and really delving right into it? What kind of support systems does your, does your college uh, have? That's an interesting question. I have a system. It's all based on teamwork, but the the approach that I have, I call it a VIP structure, vertically integrated projects. Just uh, think about a pyramid that at the very lowest level are the middle school and high schools, and uh, then the next level are the freshman students uh, at TP. Then I have my senior students. Then I have my former students that uh, the alumni that graduated that transferred to um, four-year schools at the University of New Mexico across the river. And they, I have the um, graduate students, postdocs, and faculty. So it's a layer, and there's a lot of uh, learn, teaching and learning, active teaching and learning going between the layers. So the moment that they come to my school, Although they are in remedial courses, I have a course introduction to engineering design. It's a it's minimum math requirements. Everyone is welcome, and they will be matched and assigned to a project. So that's the community of learners, and they continue working with this project through this pyramid. So so it's not all done by freshman students but I have uh, senior students, I have graduate students, and I have postdocs, and based on some agreements that I have with their advisors, uh, they make up this pyramid. And as students learn 
depending which level of interaction they are. That sounds wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. So one of the so this is the this slide that you see is a is a easy VR rover. That's the one that processes the um, native languages, and it created a lot of excitement and interest among the Navajo Nation. Just uh, a few days ago, I came from uh, I was invited to the Navajo Nation Council, and then uh, the pre Dr. Russell Begay, the president of the Navajo Nation, acknowledged the CP in the um, State of the Nation address. So this is the they are the Navajo Times reporters that are testing this uh, uh, rover that uh, responds to voice commands as stated in native languages. We like to expand this to other uh, our other partners. We have partners now across the United States. The first three years we were focusing on New Mexico. Then we got funded again by NASA Office of Education. Now we have partners in uh, Montana, uh, Sadish Kutnay College, Navajo Technical University, Fond du Lac, and we are adding more partners and we are sharing our curriculum and platform. Next, please. This is the latest edition. We call it ROWS, Recruitment Outreach Vehicle. We were inspired by uh, Rove E that was designed and built by uh, NASA JPL for outreach. And then we designed and built our own 3D printable six wheel rover that uh, is connected, is worked based on the ROS, Robot Operating System, that is used by NASA, by DOD extensively for controlling the nodes, robotic nodes, vehicles, autonomous vehicles. And then uh, we also added the Alexa dot. You can see it's sitting on the top. And uh, inside is a Nuke computer that uh, controls the whole system. So this, uh, we built five of these and we send it to our partners. We are still perfecting it, adding more features. But this is something that can walk into the classroom, it's programmed to answer questions about my college. So the students engage in conversation, asking questions about the programs, the tuition, and all these different details and it responds. And then it also, they can command it to perform different role actions. I believe that the language and is going to play a bigger and bigger role in future human man machine communications. And we can see that it's coming, the computational linguistics is coming a big part of devices, systems, and that uh, it seems that we are coming back in a circle. Huh? Human race has started with oral communication, going to icons and written communication. Now it looks like we are back to oral communication. That's a natural way of communicating with the uh, machines. So this is a emerging technology that uh, Amazon and Google are um, pioneering, and we like to introduce it to our students. So through a grant, so through a grant from NASA, we are building a Mars yard uh, on our campus. So we have a program that was funded by NASA. It's called the Information Technology Experiences using a simulated telescience exploration of Mars. So we are creating a small replica, a, 
and what the actual NASA scientists at JPL and other centers do in uh, planetary exploration. So we have built a, a replica of Yale Crater. We are placing our rovers, developing a curriculum, and the unit of, the unit of activity is a mission. So the, our partner schools can RSVP, and one school can get engaged. We can have a number of schools that are spectators, and they can log on to our Mars yard to navigate the rovers, to download the sensor information like velocity, acceleration, position, temperature. And then not only that, they can write codes and upload it into the vehicles to impact their behavior. So it's a, it's a very exciting project that um, soon will be shared across the, our uh, Chaba College colleges and the schools. A lot of these schools are smaller schools. They don't afford to come to us. And this is how we can actually go to them. Again, the go this is just a, this is not a destination. We are a community college. We are a teaching school. Uh, we, this is not the goal. This is a tool to teach them the, the journeys to teach them about the relevance of math, science, computing, especially physics. The majority of my students in high school, they don't take physics courses. Next one, please. So this program is called this IC Mars, which stands for Intelligent Cooperative Multi-Agent Robotic Systems. Rose STEM, research, outreach, student education in science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Just to make it cool for kids, we call it IC Mars. This is one of the rovers that is placed on the Mars yard. And they are, there are different rovers. One is with a gripper, the other one is a drill, and one of them has a scoop. So they can go scoop out dirt bring it back, and then just simulate a mission, a small mission. Um, this is the, the first level. They do all this in a virtual environment um, using ROS and Gazebo, just like a flight simulator. Once they graduate from the virtual uh, interaction, they move to actual physical uh, Mars yard and they perform the same in a physical environment. And the last level is a level that they design their own missions. And we provide the facility for them to perform the missions that they like to do on our facility remotely. So this, is, I call this IC Mars Rosa STEM Lab. Next one, please. So we are also uh, and have started virtual reality uh, goggles. We designed it, we built it ourselves. And then uh, a lot of the schools the, that we serve, we can create 3D, 360 videos of our facility, of our projects, of our students' activities and share it with our partner high schools through the virtual reality tools. And we are also in, in, in communications with JPL to use their on-spot or HoloLens virtual reality environment, which, is a, which you, enables you to actually walk and interact with a 3D model of Mars, which is built based on the images and the information and pictures they constantly receive from rovers on the Mars. Uh, they are willing to give us the rights 
and then we will have the HoloLens goggles for our students to be able to actually um, explore a 3D environment, virtual environment of Mars. Next one, please. We have introduced, so these are all emerging technologies that if we don't uh, introduce it to our students at some level, it doesn't have to be very advanced level, they miss the boat. These are emerging technologies that the students that need to be introduced to, be ready, because uh, if we don't do that, what we teach them, it will be obsolete in a matter of a couple of years when they graduate, they need to see, they need to know what's, what's emerging, what's coming. And, and a lot of these students are already savvy. They know about this from movies, from games. So we need to tap into that to get them interested, get them to the level of inquiry, creativity, not just entertain them. We don't want to babysit them. We, there's a fine line. We need to take them into a level that they start engaging and uh, doing problem solving. So this is an augmented reality sandbox that you can create a, a terrain, and then uh, you can project on that the levels, information about vegetation, the water. You can, it's a sandbox that you can change the Mm, terrain in order to study hydrology or wildfire spread and things like this that is mm, is part of a uh, international uh, community that we are part of that uh, but this was built by my students and we are replicating this for our partner high schools and uh, this is a uh, he's a uh, brandon brandon ray one of my uh, uh, students who graduated from CP, he's at UNM, mechanical engineering, but I have hired him back as a teaching assistant and uh, research assistant, as a role model. And this is what I mean, closing the circle, the, the, the topic of the uh, presentation. Next, please. So we do a lot of partnerships, as is as is a my vision, sharing resources. And this is the fourth summer institute that I have held on my campus. We are one of the luckiest tribal colleges in the metropolitan area in Albuquerque. We have Air Force Research Lab, Sandia National Lab, Los Alamos Lab, University of New Mexico. Uh, most of those summer colleges are in remote areas, uh, uh, far away from this uh, facility. So we were uh, the host, and we hosted five travel colleges, 17 students for eight weeks on advanced manufacturing technology with their faculty, and they built their um, 3D printable drones and 3D printable uh, robe assets, and they took it back. They had they had mentors from San Diego National Lab. They had coursework, and uh, they trained them to go back train others uh, in these technologies. And they had a good time. And then uh, it was so successful that um, it was funded by supported by American Indian Higher Education Consortium, and they are very interested to continue this. Uh, summer Institute. So this is one way that we share resources. We build capacity on top of colleges, empowering Native Americans and to a point that we can host our, we can be the host rather than just sending out our students to mainstream colleges, which is okay, but we have, we are building a capacity to be the host for summer internships. Next, please. 
So these are the four phases of the IC Mars project. The first phase is the basically course curriculum laboratory development in space sciences and technology. Phase two, as I mentioned, is a virtual IC Mars missions. Phase three is the physical IC Mars missions. And phase four is when you have a user source. You outsource it, you crowdsource it for um, developing new um, missions, physical missions or virtual missions. Next, please. What uh, this uh, slide shows uh, also another um, one of my, my the way that I look at the STEM education and that, uh, and based on the new technologies, and there are more than just one way to model, to represent the external world, to, re to model a problem. So knowledge representation comes in many different forms. Traditionally, we put a lot of emphasis on analytic form, mathematical form. But with the advent of computers, supercomputers, uh, multimedia, there are other ways to represent knowledge and explore it. So we have linguistics, natural language, words or stories, which is very common in native cultures for uh, between generations for the transfer of culture is basically language, natural language, and stories. Numerical lookup tables, databases, statistical models. Number three, graphical, animation, video, or multimedia. Number four, analytic, logical, mathematical model. Number five, computational, computer simulation, games, animations. Number six, physical, experimental, analog simulations. Testers. And number seven is also, of course, intuitional and mental. So, uh, so I, I always emphasize these seven different tools and tell my students that a creative problem solver is the one that has this toolbox, all these seven tools. And when they face a problem, they use one or two or argument one of two or combine one or two or three of these in order to model complex problems. And th there's a lot of discoveries now is happening in big data, in uh, data mining that uh, is basically on search, statistical methods, uh, possibilistics and probabilistic methods. So, so we need to mm, make sure that they, na traditionally we put a lot of emphasis on the uh, the pure math model, which is a strong language, but those other tools are as important as the a mathematical model. So oh, the students need to carry this toolbox and be able to use the proper tool for the the problem at hand. So this is the seven more world models that I always the modern classrooms should have a shop, a a traditional classroom, a computer lab, all these parts in a modern classroom. So when they face a problem, they can simulate it, they can prototype it, they can um, animate it, they can write about it, they can describe it, and then the combination of this modeling exercise will lead to um, the solution. Um, there is a problem, paradigm shift in engineering. We need to be ready for that. Environment, energy, new smart materials, computational tools, information access, these are being revolutionized. We need to understand that we have more complex problems, but we have also better tools for finding a solution. Next one, please. So these are the seven steps that we follow in order to um, develop our curriculum, our missions for the Mars yard. So I can skip this 
this one on the next slide, please. Uh, this list uh, all the different seven states that you follow. And then, uh, so throughout the 20 years of involvement with tweaking and tuning this uh, engineering program uh, to fit for the customers that I um, serve. Uh, uh, I have used different approaches, safety net certificate programs, not all the students are capable of finishing my program, so they do a dual degree, they gain some skills. Uh, computer networking or GIS, GPS, or CAD um, to fall back to. The, so I can, uh, so it's just like a pipeline from community all the way to workforce. And this pipeline is um, rusted, is uh, leaky, and it needs to be fixed. So I look at this pipeline as segmented, uh, overlapping segmented. If we can just plug in the holes, uh, we can increase the number of students. Retention is more important. Recruitment is okay, it's good. But we, I, my focus is on retention of the students and following up the students that, to make sure that they graduate. So I call it one plus one, two plus two uh, a structure. And then uh, we have four courses on the books that we can bring in cutting edge emerging technologies, like, the, uh, for example, a special topics course. We are a teaching school, but these are the four courses that are four venues to bring in and expose the students to the fast, rapidly changing technologies in, in their career. So get them ready. Give them a skills, soft skills. Next one, please. So, as I mentioned, uh, research is not a goal or destination. It's a tool for us in a community college, a two-year college, in order to, number one, to understand the relevance of math science, social sciences, computation, not tools engineering. Number two, acquiring soft skills, a quick, creative and critical thinking, lifelong learner, teamwork, time and resource management, communications. Mm. Number three, exposing to careers, careers and professional opportunities. Number four, mentoring and tutoring opportunities, VIP structure that I mentioned that, vertically integrated projects. Next one, learning uh, new and cutting edge research and development in the field, cross-disciplinary team projects. And a business student working with an engineer student, working with a science students, working with the social, social sciences. And the last and most important part for a Native American college is community-based research and development. We need to get the communities involved. There's no way. Mm, yes, the students have a strong connections, and if we want to have the support from the family, we need to show the family that education, STEM education, will lead to jobs, will lead to economical development in other communities. Other than that, they don't have any appreciation uh, for the uh, engine education. So that's a very important component, uh, ties with community. Next one, please. So this is, uh, we do a lot of problem-based learning. We ask uh, students to bring their uh, question problems uh, from their communities, from their chapter houses, and then make it a class project, like an irrigation channel, uh, like a, a, um, building a greenhouse, or extracting oil from algae. And then we make it a class project. And they take it back to the communities. And we, we invite the parents and the community leaders to sit in and uh, listen to the presentations. So there should be something that shows them that there is an added value to education. It's, it's okay if they work for the, they end up working for corporate America, 
but eventually they will go and contribute to their communities. And there are students that they want to go to back to their community. So this is a biofuel project that we did on our campus, which we, we won the national competition, a national award. Next one, please. Yeah, this is the course that I was mentioning. It's my ground zero course, Intro to Engineering and Design, uh, ENGR 105. It's open to everyone, and that's where the students get a touch of engineering. They come to CIPI they, uh, that they are aspiring to go to engineering, but they don't know what engineering is. And before I see them, it takes two years before I see them. So they have to go to a long sequence of math and science courses they lose interest. They become disenchanted. They leave. They don't know why they're taking so many courses, math and physics and science courses. They need to see the relevance. So that's a course, ground zero, for my recruitment. And past 10 years, 680 American students have gone through this course. Some of them chose to go into engineering. Some of them, they found out that that's not what they, they want to do. Next one, please. Hey, Dr. Fadi, this is Andrielle again. I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to, to uh, pose a, a couple of questions here before we get um, too far uh, yeah. with the time. Um, I really like the fact that you you are um, really, I would say, planting the seed around um, robotics. But just in general, you know, just introducing um, your students to the concept of engineering and uh, really uh, uh, just setting the stage. I, I'm kind of curious, how many of your students, um, you know, actually go into, because you mentioned that, you know, a lot of, some of them are going into engineering. Um, you know, generally speaking about, you know, as, as over your tenure time, how many students have, uh, where have they landed? What types of positions have they landed? What type of industries have they gone into? Right. This program was funded by um, NSF in 2004. It was officially started in 2006 and seven, And then so far we have graduated about 30 students. And then uh, they usually, move. this is a pre-engineering program. They, uh, they, they move on to a four-year school. And about maybe 10 of them have graduated uh, from engineering. Four of them have gone to graduate school. I have students who are working with local companies uh, and with NASA, with DOD, with uh, FAA. Uh, so yes, uh, and, and some of them, they, they like to go back to their communities and contribute. So there are not many, that not a lot of infrastructure there, but there are some areas that are interesting, like the renewable energy, IT infrastructure, technology-based small businesses. And they can start and then they create jobs. So the program, we have the largest engineering and engineering technology program among the tribal colleges, about 75 students. And just this year, we, I had 30% increase in my enrollment. This is huge for a Native American community and engineering program. So the program is robust, and we are, we are seeing that it's growing. And, uh, but of course, the fact is that out of 10 students that come to my program, maybe four or five of them end up going into a four-year school. And with the education that we give them, some of them end up to go to medical school, which is fine. Is it, we give them the foundation. Uh, and they can go pre-med or they can go to pre-law. So my students go to law schools, to medical schools, and engineering schools based on the two-year training that we give them. That, that's really great. That, that's a really, really just, I mean, that's huge testimony to all of your hard work and, and the fact that the students are, are going in a variety of fields, some of some STEM-based, some connected to STEM, but not, maybe not directly. That's, that's wonderful. Right. 
Um, yeah. I'm kind of curious. I what I'm seeing is that um, there's interest in understanding how uh, folks on the phone can uh, can help you with your work, can start making partnership connections. Um, what would you have uh, as ideas for doing that? Uh, a lot of mm -hmm. our our attendees are. Um, they, they come from a wide variety, but mainly are at four-year colleges and are in uh, positions where, you know, they have a lot of technology. And uh, I think there's there's a they ha there are technology-based um, uh, programs, online programs similar to Capella. So how can we, um, you know, start working with you to make to enhance what you've already established? As, as uh, this is an interesting question. As I mentioned to you, uh, it's a uh, it's a tier of uh, re relationship. We can have a, uh, colleges that fit into us, and we can have a partnership with colleges that we can uh, send the students to them. So it's a different level of collaborations, and um, we always, of course, our mission is uh, Native American uh, community. Uh, so we, our funding and our school is funded to serve Native Americans. So if they have a population of Native Americans, uh, we always love to work with them, partner with them. Uh, you, you uh, I have partners all across the United States, uh, from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, uh, MIT, uh, from local four-year schools, um, North Carolina a and is an African-American serving University of Texas in San Antonio. We, we, we formed a consortium and we won a funding from DOD for a center of excellence. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk to them about some sort of consortium uh, of collaboration. That's excellent. That's wonderful. Yeah, I, I think that is really one of the key things. I, one of the key things I'm hearing, um, and I, I know we've only got a couple minutes left here, uh, but a couple of, of key uh, um, themes is what I'm hearing is one, you're meeting your students where they're at, you're connecting the, connecting the uh, concepts that they have learned either through their community or just learned, you know, walking in and connecting it to more high level work around physics and robotics, which is exciting. And then, um, you know, setting them up for success, taking them to that next level, whatever that next level may be. It may be pursuing, um, you know, their degree further in a, a four-year institution and, and furthering on in, in, in post-secondary education. Or it could be, you, like you said, maybe going back into the community and serving in, in different capacities or going into some type of industry. It sounds like that they are well-equipped to, to do the work. And um, what what is exciting is that this is, a, again, a population that is relatively um, missing in the STEM areas. So, so again, much appreciative for your work, um, uh, for all that you've done. Um, I see that we do have uh, contact information up here. Um, for those that are interested in, in uh, continuing to uh, hear more about Dr. Vidi's work, feel free to uh, email him uh, at the email that's listed there. Um, if you have further questions about the work around uh, what Capella does, we do have a School of Technology, and Dr. Vidi, I will tell you, I have already uh, uh, passed this information along to our Dean of Hi. Technology. Would That's love to me. connect that with you. Um, yes. So um, at this point, I, 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 go ahead. I just mm -hmm. add something. I like to ask. You mentioned meeting the students at the level they are. So we need to that's exactly what we do. We tap into their own knowledge, their own skills, and and then move them up through the pyramid. Excellent, excellent. I'm going to put it, turn this back over to Megan. Um, I know she's got some closing remarks. Great. Thank you both so much. This was a, a great presentation, and I hope 
that our audience is inspired to look at ways that they can further increase access and serve different populations and just how important it is to meet them where they're at and continue along the journey with them. So we will be announcing the Digital Inclusion Award in April, but start thinking about the good work that you're doing so that you can submit a nomination in April. And there's some criteria here. You can also see it on the WCET webcast, or excuse me, WCET website under our awards page. So just a few more closing slides here. If you haven't been to the WCET website, we have a a tremendous resource guide there. We develop talking points on important topics to help you be prepared to uh, address emerging issues in higher ed around digital learning and technology enhanced learning. We did record this, we'll make it available on our website next week. And we've all been very busy around here getting ready for our annual meeting, which is next week in Denver. If it's too soon and you can't join us in Denver, we will be reconvening next year for our 30th anniversary celebration in Portland, and that's in October 2018. So thank you to our WCET supporting members and our annual sponsors that help underwrite our programs and events here. So we'll see you on the next WCET webcast. We actually have a pretty exciting one brewing, so more to come on that. Thank you for participating, and thank you to our wonderful presenters. Have a good day. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.